Hello and welcome to the next physics video uh, in my series following Young and Friedman's University Physics. We're in chapter 19 on the first law of thermodynamics and we're almost done with the chapter. This is the second to last section of the chapter and it is on heat capacities of an ideal gas. Heat capacities, huh? I don't know if you remember back in chapter 17 we talked about something called specific heat. Um, not a great way to call it, because I know, what does that mean, specific heat? But if you've had a little chemistry, um, and there's a chemistry video in my universe on this as well, um, that you know that a specific heat has to do with the amount of heat necessary to increase the temperature of a certain mass, like one gram of something, by a certain temperature, or a certain number of degrees, that is, and uh, usually calculated in Kelvin, the absolute scale. So that's the specific heat, the amount of heat necessary to increase the temperature of a gram by a Kelvin. So here's the formula. Q equals mc delta T. Um, the amount of heat that it takes to raise uh, something by a delta T of one uh, Kelvin, uh, that is one gram, is C, the specific heat, small c. So there you have the specific heat. Back to chapter 17. Go look up the video. Now, for this particular section, we're more interested in another uh, constant that we learned back then in chapter 17 called the molar heat capacity. Now, the molar heat capacity is the amount of heat it takes uh, to raise the temperature of a mole of a substance by a degree Kelvin. The formula is very similar. Instead of mc delta T, it's Q equals nc delta T, where n is the number of moles, big C, is the molar heat constant, and of course, delta T is Kelvin, and Q is also heat, joules usually. Okay, so happy days are here again. So now let's talk about a little bit more detailed. Chapter 17, what a wonderful world. Now we're talking about um, uh, differing pressures, differing volumes, and things like that. So what we find is that the molar heat constant, the molar heat capacity, differs a little bit depending on how you're changing things. So you have the molar heat capacity at constant volume, which is big C with a, a V subheading, okay, or a subtitle. So um, subscript. Uh, molar heat capacity at constant volume is CV whereas the molar heat capacity at constant pressure is Cp, where P is for pressure, surprisingly. Okay, and so this, the constant, big C, is gonna differ a little depending on whether you are changing um, um, the heat and temperature at a constant volume or whether you're changing it at a constant pressure. Now, what, what we find is that the molar heat capacity at constant pressure uh, for an ideal gas uh, has to be greater than the molar heat capacity at constant volume. And the reason for this is because if the volume isn't changing, then no work is being done. And so you're just dealing with heat. Um, but if, if you have a changing pressure, uh, or I'm sorry, if you have a constant pressure, uh, then the volume is going to be changing. Um, and so you're going to have more variables and um, it's going to do work as well. Um, and so, uh, it has a larger a larger vo value. Um, so the CP is uh, going to be greater than CV for all ideal gases, mostly for um, non-ideal gases as well. Although there's some some unusual situations. Okay, so let's let's move on then. Here is the relationship between the molar heat capacity constant pressure and the molar heat capacity at constant uh, volume. Um, we just said that the molar heat capacity at constant pressure is larger uh, than the molar heat capacity at constant volume. So um, what we find is that the difference between the two is the gas constant. Remember R, PV equals NRT, it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, so this is the relationship. And you don't necessarily have to know the derivation, which I'm about to show. Um, you just mainly need to know uh, this formula. Now we want to show how to derive this. Again, you just need to know the formula, really. But let me show you how this is derived. 
So you'll remember we just defined or defined molar heat capacity in terms of this formula, Q, the amount of heat, equals N, the number of moles, times the molar heat capacity, constant delta T, okay? So if we're talking about constant volume, the same relationship is going to exist. Uh, we're going to use the molar heat capacity at constant volume, because we're talking about constant volume. And then if we, we're talking about an incremental change, then DQ, not Dairy Queen, but the infinitesimal change in heat, is going to equal the number of moles times the molar heat capacity at constant volume, constant, um, times the incremental change in temperature. Okay, so far so good. Now, because we're talking about constant volume, there's no work involved. Um, work is done when, when the volume increases or, or decreases. Um, and, and so, um, either po you know, uh, positive work, negative work. So um, we can say that there's no work involved at constant volume. So remember U uh, equals um, a Q minus W. And so with no W there, DU basically equals DQ. And so we can say that DU equals, equals that. So that's for constant volume. Now for constant pressure, um, we, we have again uh, that DQ is going to be NCP DT. So the incremental change in heat is going to equal the number of moles times the molar uh, heat capacity at constant pressure, dt, okay, that's, okay, fair enough, just, we've just done it now for constant pressure, but um, we now have work involved uh, when, with the changing pressure. There's going to be a change in volume um, when, uh, when pressure is being uh, exerted. So dw, the, the infinitesimal change in work, is going to equal pdv, the pressure times the incremental I'll change in volume. We've talked about that in previous videos. Now, uh, PV equals NRT, right? So we can take the V and say that V equals NRT over P, right? And so do a little algebra, uh, NRT over P, the P's cancel out, and we're left to NR, we're left with NR uh, DT, okay? Incremental, incremental change in temperature. Now, so U is going to equal uh, the sum of these two, right? Um, so, let me pause for a second. Okay, I've got my moorings. Um, so this is the, this is the, re, it's rearranged. It's Q equals U plus W, right? Which is another way of formulating uh, the first law of thermodynamics. So this is Q, which we just had here. Uh, this is U, uh, which we defined up here, but for, this is an ideal gas, right? And so for an ideal gas, um, U is going to be directly proportional to T, no matter what. Okay, so we can put that in there. And then here is dW. So uh, Q equals, I, I didn't put it all there to save space, but Q equals U plus uh, W, right? Now, you'll notice a lot of common things here, N, 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 DT, DT, DT. So if I divide all of these by uh, N, DT, we get voila, uh, the, the three dots stands for therefore. Uh, CP equals CV plus R. Ta da! So we have derived this. Um, again, you just need to know this equation. You don't need to know, uh, unless you have a torturous professor who wants you to know it, uh, you just need to know uh, that. All right. So uh, let's slow this down, shall we? There we go. So we want to define gamma. That's the Greek letter G, basically, gamma. We want to define the constant gamma as the ratio of the uh, molar heat capacity at constant pressure to the molar heat capacity at constant volume. So gamma will be helpful, um, a shorthand, you know, in, in our formulas, formulae, um, if we define gamma as this ratio, ratio of heat capacities, sometimes called the ratio of specific heats too, which is again, not very helpful. So let's talk about the ratio of heat capacities instead. So we got that. So for monatomic gases, that is gases that consist of one molecule like helium, and of course the ideal gases, um, this will be likely. Um, and so from last chapter, chapter 18, um, we defined um, the, well, we didn't define it, we derived it, but the, the molar heat capacity constant volume we found in the previous chapter for monatomic gases was three halves R, this gas constant again, 8.314. Um, and so 
what we can do is we can substitute this in uh, for for the, for here. What we find is is that um, CP the the um, molar heat capacity constant pressure we know from the previous formula uh, on the previous page. Remember, blah 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 blah. There it is. We know this formula right here. CP equals CV plus R, right? So if, C, if CP equals CV plus R, and if CV equals three halves R, then we know that the molar heat capacity at constant pressure is three halves R plus R, which is five halves R. Yay, okay. And so we can predict therefore, there's again my therefore three dots, that gamma is going to equal the ratio of these two, that's what we define it to be, which is going to be five halves R, CP, over three halves R, uh, uh, CV, and that's going to equal um, basically five thirds or um, 1.66666666666 and I'll stop there. Okay, so, well, and, and this of course confirm, this corresponds to experimental values as well. And so you can, you, there's a chart in Young and Friedman here to show um, certain monatomic gases that have that ratio, that gamma ratio. Okay, now for diatomic gases, and again, let me slow this one down. Let's try that again. So gamma for monatomic gases is going to be typically 1.6 to infinity, somewhere around there, right? Now, what about for diatomic gases? Well, from the previous chapter, from chapter 18, we learned there that the molar heat capacity at constant volume was five halves R, um, the gas constant, all right? So we can do the same formula. We can say that since the molar heat capacity constant pressure equals the molar heat capacity constant volume plus R, if in the case of diatomic gases, CV is five halves R, then CP is going to be five halves R plus R, which is seven halves R. Okay, so when we put, we therefore calculate gamma, the ratio of CP to CV as seven halves R over five halves R, and that's gonna come out to be seven fifths or roughly 1.4. And again, you can look at the chart uh, in Young and Friedman, and it, this bears out experimentally as well. well. The last thing in this section uh, that uh, they slip in at the end is this, that remember that because uh, in an ideal gas, internal energy is only dependent upon temperature, that for an ideal gas, internal energy is not dependent on pressure, um, internal energy is not dependent on volume, Therefore, for an ideal gas, the change in internal energy is going to equal NCV delta T regardless uh, of the volume, uh, there because there's no, um, it, it's simply dependent upon temperature. Okay, well, if your brain is scrambled, let me sum up. What have we learned in this video? We have learned first, that the molar heat capacity at constant pressure is always greater than the molar heat capacity at constant volume for an ideal gas, and it's usually also the, that way for a non-ideal gas. We've learned that the molar heat capacity at constant pressure equals, oh, uh, let me put the V as a subscript. There we go. We've learned that the molar heat capacity at constant pressure equals the molar heat capacity at constant volume plus the gas constant. We've learned that gamma is a constant that is the ratio of the molar heat capacity at constant pressure to the molar heat capacity at constant volume. We've learned that for monatomic gases, gamma is going to be about 1.67. And for diatomic gases, gamma is gonna be about 1.4. Finally, we've learned, or we've been reminded, that for an ideal gas, the change in internal energy is only dependent on the change in temperature. And thus, that delta U equals NC, and let me change the constant again, NCB delta T. By the way, happy Easter. This has been um, some talk about molar heat capacity um, and how it relates to um, constant pressure uh, and constant volume.